السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم Praise be to Allah We praise him and we seek his help Whomsoever Allah guides is a truly guided one and whomsoever Allah leaves a say none can show him guidance My dear respected viewers everywhere Welcome to another live edition of our program Ask Huda Our phone numbers beginning with the area code are 002 then 32 Alternatively, area code 002, then 01005469323. The WhatsApp number is area code 1347806025. Well, we're also live on my page, on the Facebook page, that is M. Salah uh, Official. So without any further ado, like to tackle some of the pending questions, inshallah. Uh, the first question is from Jasmine Moin. Sister Jasmine says, please let me know about Adab in Qabr. Does it mention uh, in the Quran? Is it mentioned in the Quran? Well, yes, it is mentioned in the Quran. She's asking about whether there is some sort of reckoning and recompense in the grave, which is known as Al-Barzakh the transient life between the uh, worldly life and resurrection, then the actual reckoning and the day of judgment. Yes, there are references from the Quran and from the sound sunnah alike. We find uh, in the Quran in Surah Ghafir, the Almighty Allah says about the fate of the Pharaoh and his hosts that um, when they were drowned, فَأُغْرِقُوا فَأُدْخِلُوا نَارَ فَلَمْ يَجِدُوا لَهُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْصَارًا That they had been drowned, then they were admitted into fire, and they had no helpers or supporters to avail them against Allah. Somebody might say, well, the ayah could also mean that after they died as non-believers, the Pharaoh and his host, eventually they will end up in fire, but not necessarily now, rather in the hereafter. So, um, in uh, the reference I gave you is of Surah uh, Nuh, peace be upon him. مما خطيئاتهم أغرقوا فأدخلوا نارا فلم يجدوا لهم من دون الله أنصارا. Then in uh, Surah Ghafir, the Almighty Allah says about the Pharaoh and his people, النار يعرضون عليها غدوا وعشية. Again, that the Pharaoh and his army and his hosts are being punished by hellfire in the morning and in the evening. Somebody may argue, but the torment of hellfire will be in the hereafter. It doesn't say in the grave. Then there comes the following text where Allah the Almighty says, وَيَوْمَ تَقُومُ السَّاعَةُ أَدْخِلُ آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ أَشَدَّ الْعَدَالِ Then when the day of judgment takes place and it is established, Allah will order his angels to admit the Pharaoh and his host into the worst of punishment and torment, which means the punishment which they are being exposed to in the morning and in the evening, This is in the barzakh life. Whether the person is actually buried in a grave or the person was uh, incarnated and his body was uh, turned into ashes, then sprayed on a windy day in the stream, or the person died in the sea or the river, drowned, and his body was not recovered, it doesn't matter, because the barzakh for every person is where he or she will end up. So that is the ayah 46 of Surah Ghafir, which confirms that النار يعرضون عليها غدوًا وعشية ويوم تقوم الساعة أدخلوا آل فرعون أشد العذاب. Then we have many ahadith 
a sound hadith which is collected by Imam Bukhari and Muslim in which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said as he passed by the graveyard and then he alerted his companions to the condition of two Muslims who are buried in their graves and he said indeed they are being punished in their graves yet they are not being punished for something which was inevitable or hard to avoid it was easy to avoid then he made mention of the cause of the punishment he said so they're being punished in the graves because one of them used not to clean up after answering the call of nature, after urination. And the second used to gossip and walk around people with calumnies. So he used to slander and gossip people. When they died, they were being held accountable in their graves and this is in the Barzakh before the next life before the actual judgment day so from this hadith and many other hadith such as how often the messenger of Allah peace be upon him used to seek refuge with Allah again is the torment of the grave every prayer after reciting tashahud and before making taslim he used to say O oh Allah, I seek refuge with you against the torment of the grave and the torment of hellfire. He used to seek refuge with Allah against four things. The trial of life and death, the trial of the false messiah, and the torment of the grave and the torment of hellfire. From all of that, it is the belief of the mainstream ummah and ahlul sunnah wal jama'ah that the grave is the first stage towards the hereafter. And when people die, they do not just sit and rest uh, and in peace, as many people say, no, it's either uh, a garden of paradise or a pit of hellfire, depending on what the person will get to see in the hereafter. And this is also to declare and to announce to this person that he would be either saved or ruined when the Day of Judgment is established. In a long hadith narrated by Al-Bara ibn Azib, the Prophet said in one of its segments when a person is finished with the questioning and then a man will appear to him in his grave wearing nice and neat clothes and looking exceedingly bright and wearing nice fragrance and cologne so the person, the dead person will talk to him now he sees a visitor in the grave with him his family and loved ones have left but who is this guest so he will say to him man ant الذي يأتي بالخير. he has such a beautiful face wearing neat clothes you smell great you must be bringing good news then he would ask him how come you don't know me don't you recognize me no I don't he will say I am your good deed أنا عملك الصالح so he will rejoice and at that a window in his grave will be open to see his seat and his dwelling place in paradise. So the dead person will proclaim saying, Rabbi aqim al-sa'a, my Lord, establish the day of judgment. I'm ready for it right now. Why? Because he's assured that he will be saved. On the other hand, the wicked person will see an ugly looking person with very uh, you know stinky smell very scary look so he would ask him who are you you're scaring me and he would say likewise how come you don't recognize me I am your evil deeds and after telling him so a window in his grave will be open so that he could see his dwelling place and hell fire may Allah protect us again is that and he will proclaim saying Rabbi la tuqim as-sa'ata abada my lord never ever establish the day of judgment these are some of the ahadith some of the ahadith you know in addition to the references from the Quran which assures us that when people die they do not just sit and wait waiting for resurrection 
but there is some sort of activities on daily basis based on whether they were good or bad and that would give them an idea of how and where will their faith be inshallah in the hereafter may Allah make us among those who will be eligible for his salvation on the day of judgment Amin Musabbir uh, Imran says Assalamu alaikum suppose I work in a software company and they tell me to develop a software for a bank to collect interest from its customers so is it halal for me to work uh, to produce such software the answer is definitely not that is because Allah forbids us against helping or assisting or cooperating with others in doing anything which is forbidden and uh, keep this golden rule in your heart and your mind brothers and sisters whatever leads to what is forbidden is actually forbidden as well I grow grapes why because grapes taste sweet my fruits but I grow them because the beer company the alcohol company they buy it from me they squeeze it they turn it into fine liquor then it is haram to grow such grapes so the work itself as a software programmer is halal is permissible but the problem with why do you do it to serve whom and it will lead to doing what so at any stage if you figure that your work your effort your intelligence would be serving something forbidden then it's not permissible somebody who is a software programmer and uh, an IT person is developing a website for a porn company halal or haram absolutely haram and he's a partner in spreading the evil exactly may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best وَلَا تَعَاوَنُوا عَلَى الْإِثْمِ وَالْعُدْوَانِ do not help nor assist one another in doing anything which is uh, forbidden sister Maryam Marana and thank you so much for your nice compliment just keep making dua for Huda TV may Allah bless you and your family and all the viewers uh, Sita bint Harun uh, is asking I would like to ask if I could pay my mother zakah for the gold that I bought for her she is also dependent on me with her expenses she has difficulty of paying uh, her zakah yes of course for the payment of zakah whether it is paid by the person who owes a zakah or anybody else provided that they acknowledge that they approve that they have been informed it is the same because the beneficiary who is a poor or the zakah recipient have achieved the goal which is receiving the benefit the zakah uh, most women as Muslims when we give gold ornament to our wives to our daughters to our sisters to our mothers as a, as a gift you know uh, they cannot afford to pay zakah on that and we say that according to the Hanafi school of thought it is mandatory to pay zakah on gold ornament so in this case if the person cannot afford to do it and the husband does it even if she can afford to do it she is wealthy on her own but the husband does it on a regular basis cool no problem enjoy it so may Allah bless your sister and enable you to take care of your mother Kaniz Sayyida Kaniz Sayyida can you please explain the concept of wasila yes I hope I can but it's just a long uh, subject to address in answering one question but briefly we have in Surat um, Al-Ma'idah the Almighty Allah says Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu attaqu allaha wa bataghu ilayhi al-wasilata wa jahidu fi sabilihi la'allakum tuflihoon I love this ayah Oh who you believe keep your duty to Allah and 
seek the means of approach towards him, to Allah, and struggle for his cause in order to be successful. In order to be successful. So all who you believe, keep your duty to Allah, seek the means of approach, struggle for his sake in order to be successful. All right. What is the wasila here? Al wasila is the means of approach. The Sunnah explains the following: that if a person is in need and he wants his need to be fulfilled, he can ask Allah via some means of approach, some wasila. Its plural is wasail, the means of approach. What does the Sunnah teach us? The Prophet ﷺ taught us. What could be utilized as a means of approach? Number one, Allah Himself and His names and attributes. Allah the Almighty says, وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ To Allah belongs Al-Asma'u Al-Husna, the beautiful names. فَدْعُوهُ بِهَا So invoke Allah and call upon Him through His beautiful names. Yani what? How am I supposed to call upon Allah by the means of His beautiful names? I've committed a sin and I'm seeking forgiveness. What among the names of Allah that is pertaining to pardoning, forgiveness and mercy? Afu, Ghafoor, Rahim, Rahman. So raise your hands and say, Ya Rahman, As-Samawati, Wal-Ardi, Wa Rahimihima, Irham me. اغفر لي يا غفور اغفر لي يا عفو اعف عني اللهم انك عفو تحب العفو فاعف عنا This is what the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam taught us and the ayah is from the Quran surah al-A'raf the reference So calling upon Allah by the means of his beautiful names and attributes is the best wasila Secondly by the means of our obedience and good deeds our obedience and good deeds and we have a long hadith. It's hard to comprehend it or study it all uh, right now. The three people who got stuck in the cave and a rock blocked the exit. So when they were certain that they will die, each one of them made dua, asking Allah to give them a relief and to release them out of this prison because they would die there. Uh, and each one of them invoked Allah via the means of one of his good deeds. So two of them have done some good deeds which were like secretly. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala every time one of them would make dua, Allah would open uh, the rock, would remove it a little bit, but it wasn't sufficient for them to exit from that uh, cave which they got stuck in. Until the third made a dua. And the third supplication was via the means of something bad, a major sin that he was about to commit, but he abstained and seized for the sake of Allah, seeking the pleasure of Allah and out of fear of Allah. So that is perceived as a good deed as well. He was about to commit adultery. So the woman reminded him that fear Allah. So he sat up and he let her go and he didn't do it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala removed the rock and they were all released. That's a sound hadith. I know perhaps you're asking about, can I ask Allah? And I see the means of approach to Allah through the Prophet and the righteous people and the awliya and all of that. Well, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the dearest to Allah. He has commanded us in the Quran to increase sin and the peace and the blessings upon him. Sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima. Right? Well, in this case, if you set and you send the peace and the blessings upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu then you say, Oh Allah, and you ask for any need to be fulfilled, that is most likely and more worthy to fulfill your need, because you did what Allah the Almighty ordered you. Some people say, Oh Allah, via the means of my love, a reverence to Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, accept my dua. Is that acceptable? Acceptable. Because our love, Obedience and reverence to Prophet Muhammad وسلم, is an act of worship. It is one of the topmost parts of ibadat, loving Allah and His Messenger. 
عليه وسلم بسايد ذات السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته رضر عبد الحميد from the UK السلام عليكم شيخ وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته Everybody is fine. Alhamdulillah. Thank you for asking. Um, my question is based on um, travel, uh, you know, when you, I don't know what it's called, basically. Um, I live in the United Kingdom. So let's say, for instance, I go to America for two weeks. So how do I observe my solar? Does it have to be, you know, does it have to be full? أخي عبد الحميد السلام عليكم كان يهير مي عبد الحميد كان يهير مي okay basically the sound was breaking off I was only able to hear about how can you pray what I'm not sure if you can repeat the question a little louder and clearer I will appreciate that it's shortening of prayers shortening shortening of the prayer shortening of prayer yes what about it um, cause I live in United Kingdom. So if I go to America, where of course I don't live there, where I go for like two weeks, how do I observe my Salah? Fajr Maghrib, you know, Zor Hasr Maghrib Isha. How do I pray? Do I have to pray in full Raka or how do I shorten my prayer? Okay. For like 14 days. Okay. Okay. Got your question, brother Abdul Hamid from the United Kingdom. Shortening the prayers for a traveler is a concession that Allah bestowed upon Muslims to enjoy if you are traveling any travel distance anything more than 48 kilometers and since you're going to the States you enjoy shortening the prayers two conditions have to be met the journey is halal the travel distance and the period the period how many days you'll be traveling is a point of difference among the scholars but the vast majority of the scholars are of the view that if you plan to stay somewhere more than four days, then in this case from day one you pray full. You will be treated as resident. You know, some of the scholars say that up to 15 days or 19 days or 20 days, and some others say so long as you're traveling. But I'm just giving you what most of the scholars have come to an agreement over. Uh, so if you're going to the States, you arrive to New York, you don't know how long you stay. Keep shortening the prayer, even if it lasts for a month because you're undecided. And you're jumping from one state to another, from one city to another. You are on a journey. You can keep enjoying shortening the prayers and sometimes even combining two prayers at the time of either one of them, like Dhuhr and Asr together at the time of either one, and Maghrib and Isha at the time of either Maghrib or Isha. Assalamu alaikum. Brother Muhammad from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Umar from Bahrain. Assalamu alaikum. Umar. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ya Umar. Umar from Bahrain, Sheikh. Ahlan wa sahlan. Welcome to our school. Jazakallah khat, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khat, Sheikh. Alhamdulillah. Khat, Sheikh. Sheikh, I have a question regarding regarding the Qabriya and Ba'diya. If in case, yani, I'm praying the Ba'diya after Salat al-Duhul. Mm. I have to pray like two rakats, um, but there is a hadith not sure regarding its authenticity that if someone pray four rak rakats after Salat al he will be he will not be affected with the hellfire. Mm. Okay. I have the tunniya, yani pray the baadiya for two rakats, and I just pray in total only four units. Is it permissible, or I have to pray that two separate like body, and then I pray the other four in okay. case the hadith is open? I, I got your question, Ahi Umar. The hadith that you're referring to, Brother Umar from Bahrain, may Allah bless him, is asking about for the audience who do not know the Arabic terms that he has used, qabli and Badiya, the emphatic sunan, al rawatib, which is or which are recommended highly recommended and emphatically recommended to pray before the fard prayer and after qabliya means before ba'diya means after we pray the fard we have the hadith of uh, um habiba may allah be pleased with her that when the messenger of allah peace be upon him said that whoever observes 
12 rak'ahs or prayers dissonant qabli and ba'diyya before and after Allah will build them a house in paradise if you observe that on regular basis on daily basis so in this hadith she mentioned four rak'ahs before dhuhr and two rak'ahs after dhuhr then two after maghrib two after isha and two before fajr the total is 12 rak'ahs there is another hadith which is a sound hadith Omar that the Prophet ﷺ says whoever will observe and keep taking care of four rak'ahs before dhuhr and four rak'ahs after dhuhr hellfire will never touch his flesh his flesh will never be touched by hellfire so uh, a combination of both would lead to praying 14 rak'ahs every day and night not 12 rak'ahs which is perfectly fine okay so what you need to do is as the prophet ﷺ said in the hadith the nawafil prayer the best way to offer them is two by two so before though you pray two rakahs tashahud and taslim then another two rakahs tashahud and taslim while though itself four rakahs with the middle tashahud but by the end tashahud and taslim and after though you pray two by two as well this is where you obtain the promise that is delivered in the hadith which i just shared with you it's a sound hadith may allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide all of us to what is best Muhammad Kalis says, Assalamu alaikum, when doing Hajj or Tamattu' after performing Umrah, can you get out of Ihram a uh, white piece of cloth until we are then ready to do the Hajj? This is basically Hajj or Tamattu' Muhammad. If you don't Tamattu', you finish your Umrah Tawf and Sa', you cut your hair and you remove the white cloth or the Ihram and then you live your regular life. Then on the eighth day of Dhul Hijjah, you make a new intention from your hotel room. You say, Labbaika Hajjah. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Samina from the United Kingdom. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Yes, I can hear you and I can hear a whistle as well. Yeah, that's it. The attorney Just stay away from. Uh, from the source of voice, if you are next to the tablet or TV screen, move to another room and hear me from your handset. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Hello? Yes, I hear you. I hear you. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. So, Shaykh, this is a really serious question, so I would like to stay on line when I speak to you. So, I'm a 19-year-old female, and um, I, um, I, I started praying not long ago. Um, so I started praying, and um, I started praying five times a day, every single day. Um, and I know, and and um, I never knew you were a if you stopped praying. But basically, I suffer. I started like finding more stuff out about purity, impurity. Like I didn't know impurity could transfer through wetness, and and I started to get these doubts. Not doubts, but I just felt impure, and it would literally take me over an hour to do istinja. It would take me over an hour to wash my clothes. Like. Every time I put them in the washing machine, I put them. I put them twice instead of once because I feel like they won't be pure mm. during the once. And when I wash my hands, when it has impurity, I, I rub it. I feel like I can't just pour water over. I start rubbing my hands and and like I cut my nails really short because I feel like you know what is dirt gets. I know dirt is in my just but still like I cut my nails really short and it just and even on my praying that like. And like the floor, that I know there's impurity in the floor, and every time I clean it, I just feel like it's not pure enough. And and I stopped praying due to that. So I hold the view that if you stop praying, you're gassed. So I'm wondering, am I gassed enough because I've stopped praying? But I like, but I believe that because it's three hadith saying that the one who abandons the life. I got your question, you know, Sister Samina. I got your question. And yeah. please pay attention, pay close attention to the answer. You can hang up and listen to the answer now. I would wait so that you can uh, uh, raise the volume on your device or if you're watching us on the screen, because this is important. What you've said is one of the means through which Satan possesses a person in order to make him hate the worship. They don't have these doubts in their daily lives. Do their homework, going to work, buying their groceries. The, the, the doubts, especially with the issue of purity and tahara and istinja, only happens in the worship. Because we as Muslims, we know that Allah won't accept the prayer unless if the person is pure. 
So you come to us, Satan will come to a person in the prayer and say, guess what? You lost your wudu. Oh, maybe you don't have a wudu to begin with. So throughout the four rakahs, the person is debating himself or herself. Do I have wudu or have I lost my wudu? So that the person would offer the physical part of the prayer while his mind and his heart was absent. The person was absent-minded. So Satan is very happy because your prayer is void from reward. You just did the ritual part. Also, he puts the doubt in the mind of people, a lot of people concerning the process of istinja and whether I have leaked some fluids or not and whether I have to wash my clothes again or not and how many times in order to secure the purity and whether I have made wudu perfectly or I have forgotten one body part or two. or So they keep repeating the process over and over to the point that they hate themselves, they hate the worship. Or if the sister is married, her husband would say, you know what, honey, just quit praying because you're not, you, you lost it already. So the prophet, peace be upon him, have already answered all these questions in a very simple sentence. He says, Leave that which puts you in doubt into that which keeps you in certainty. What does it mean? That's to be explained. If a person happens to physically examine himself or herself and they see in their undergarment that there is a fluid excretion. And this fluid excretion, the flow is constant. No problem. That is perceived as urine incontinence. Whether it is vaginal excretion or urethral excretion. So what am I supposed to do then? Whether you're a man or a woman, simply keep wearing a pad. And whenever it is a prayer time and you hear the adhan, or it is the adhan time, make istinja, make wudu, purify yourself, and make wudu and pray. But I feel like there is, uh, you know, the fluid is flowing, or urine drops, it doesn't matter. I know this is happening. This case, which is known as urine incontinence, or anything similar to it, is a constant condition you're experiencing. So Allah gives you ease. And the golden rule in fiqh, it says, al tajlibu taysir. Once there is a hardship, Allah delivers ease. Okay? So do istinja once, only sister. Okay? And then uh, wear a pad and perform wudu and offer the prayer. With this single wudu, which you have made after the prayer time is due, you can pray a thousand rak'ah of nawafil if you want to the sunnah before and the sunnah after, all the way until the next prayer time. So the only hardship that you may encounter is having to make wudu for each prayer. That's it. But between the prayers, you want to pray sunnah in tahiyatul masjid, istikhara or whatever, you're not required to make another wudu because this condition is constant. And once you have wudu, never mind, dismiss any doubts. Thank you, brothers and sisters, for tuning in. It's time to take a short break, and we'll be back, inshallah, in a couple of minutes. Please stay tuned. One day the Prophet ﷺ came out to the companions عنهم, and he said to them, Don't you bear witness that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one worthy of worship and he has no partners? Don't you bear witness that I'm the messenger of Allah? Don't you bear witness that the Quran is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the companions عنهم, they said, Yes, O Prophet of Allah. Then the Prophet وسلم, said, فأبشروا, Have the glad tidings, the great news as a result of this. Because the Quran has two ends to it. One end with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and one end in your hands. Then he said to them والسلام, Hold fast to it because you would never be led astray and you would never be perished if you're holding fast to the book of Allah. Because of that, join us every week in Quran in depth where we recite 
and reflect and ponder over the verses of the Quran. We go in depth into the verses, following the ways of the Prophet ﷺ and the companions عنهم, when they used to take the verses, one set of verses after another. They would recite it, they would reflect upon the meanings of it, and they would act according to it, and then they would go to the next set of verses. Join us every week in Quran in depth so that we would recite and reflect and learn more about the Book of Allah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our life and to make us among those who follow the Quran and the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. really come to understand that to be a Muslim, to be someone who says they've surrendered and submitted to the will of God, is to be in harmony with everything around you and to be a benefit to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, our creator, he gave us a life plan. He told us what to do. He, he gave us, you know, goals and what he expects from us. It has roots in Islam because the first man who was created Adam, he was neither a Jew or a Christian, but he submitted himself to God, Abraham. He didn't submit to anyone in creation. He didn't even hear in any of these religions. But when he was told to do what? Submit to the will of God. That's it's not attached to his preconceived notions. Yes. And if he looks with an objective eye and an open heart, he'll see it. Unless Allah for some reason has something over his eyes because yeah. of something that we don't know is in his heart. Uh, you had from 1980 to 2005, you had the FBI data report showing that now from all these years that only 6% had mm -hmm. any links to Islam. 94% were people who had nothing to do with Islam. This is the danger. This is the danger. This is the Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. I assume that we have uh, a caller on the phone. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, please try again. Well, John Smith is asking, Assalamu alaikum and thank you. Uh, if you're a store owner, a non Muslim, come to shop and pay with credit card. Am I allowed to take that form of payment or is it haram? No, you're allowed to take that form of payment and you're not blameworthy. Whether this person is a Muslim or a non-Muslim. You know the Prophet ﷺ purchased and sold and mortgaged with the Jews. Okay, they dealt with riba. But what matters is the transaction between me and him. You know, am I charging interest? Is he charging me interest? No. He's buying food and he's paying me money. And this money, I don't know how he obtained it, whether he's dealing with riba, whether he's, you know, so um, the service I'm offering is I'm selling him the goods and he's paying me. So there is no problem in this regard. Akhi, barakallah feek. Um, Samira Khan, assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. If a husband is not happy for the wife to start wearing a niqab, or he wants her to take it off. What must she do? Obey him or still wear it? Come to a middle word, Sister Samira. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have informed us that if he commands anything, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرًا so if this matter is an ordainment or a fard, it is not a subject of discussion. But this matter that we are talking about, wearing a niqab, is a matter which has a difference of opinion among the scholars. So if the husband, and I'm not sure where are you guys living at, if he perceives it is not secure, it is not, uh, you know, 
it's dangerous for you to wear a face veil like in some of the countries who you know some of their homegrown crazies they chase Muslim sisters who are in the Kaaba and they harass them, harass them and so on so in this case he has a valid point I cannot antagonize him based on reading the question without the background if you give me some ba background like if you're living in Pakistan and you are a, you want to wear niqab wear niqab and every husband if your wife you're living in a Muslim country and your wife says I want to wear a face veil support her 100% she is looking for modesty or extra modesty extra chastity this is for your own benefit you gotta support her Okay, barakallahu feekum. Assalamu alaikum. Naveed from Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah Naveed. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, as alaikum salam, Sheikh. How are you? I'm fine, alhamdulillah. Just raise your voice a little bit, please. Yeah, okay. Um, Sheikh, I have some questions regarding... Uh, could you please explain um, some dua or, uh, so that, that increase the risk? Sure. Okay. Any other and questions? My another question is yeah, uh, regarding a hadith uh, that was explained in uh, Nasai. Okay. What is the hadith? Where uh, Prophet Muhammad entered a masjid and he find the person was about to finish his salah and he was reciting some dua like Allahumma inni asaluka ya Allah. I think you already know and then. And the end, uh, the Prophet Muhammad said, you are forgiven. Uh, All right. Okay. I have your questions, Naveed. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, but uh, is it so many? Because I have another question. Go ahead, go ahead, quickly, uh, please. Uh, yes, uh, this is about the slave in, in, in Islam. Because I have sometimes a contradictory question I couldn't explain mm -hmm. clearly to others. That it was uh, permitted uh, to have... Uh, um, relationship, a sexual relationship with the slave without get married at the time of Prophet Muhammad with the companions, because uh, there are some thing explained that you have permitted uh, with the relationship with your wife and right hand poses. This explanation I didn't find actually the clear uh, any explanation. I couldn't find it. Okay, we have a okay. full program uh, called it is called Islam Unveiled and Lifting the Fog, where we've covered this particular point so many times okay and I explained it in details because it will not be five or ten minutes to explain it we'll have to go through the process of milkul yameen what the right hand possesses from the beginning and it is not something that um, you know prophet muhammad وسلم, invented rather islam came to eliminate and eradicate gradually and step by step and a woman who is embraced by the person who owned her at that time, she had become the mother of the child and she is not a slave anymore. Okay? Of course, there is a long list of the Quran, Quranic verses prescribing what is known as ransom or kafarat. If a person does this or that, the ransom is to free a slave. Then the Prophet ﷺ encouraged people to free their slaves for the sake of Allah. One hadith he said, Whoever frees a slave, in the Arabic term, they use the word raqaba or neck, refers to a servant or a slave. Allah the Almighty will free him and for every body part and limb that he freed for that slave, will free his limbs and his body parts from hellfire. And when a Sahabi came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, um, and uh, he said that he slapped his servant, his slave. And the Prophet ﷺ prescribed the ransom, the kafara, is to free that person. It's, it's, it's a long, long story and we only have five minutes left in the program. With regards to the means of increasing the provision and the supplication to increase the provision. What about if tomorrow, inshallah, uh, I will uh, present a whole live broadcast on my page it will be about the means of increasing the provision increasing the risk and also the means of decreasing one's provision and risk hopefully inshallah i will get to see you tomorrow to answer uh, or to present 
um, a program about that, inshallah. Um, uh, John Smith, while performing ghusl, if you release gas or get the urge to release gas, do you have to start all over again from the beginning? Okay, the, the thing is, brothers and sisters, in ghusl, it is to lift the measure impurity. If the ghusl is intended to lift a measure of impurity and the person intends so and he did wudu that lifts the minor impurity as well so that when he comes out he is ready to pray but if he passes wind and he doesn't make wudu again that invalidates it okay so if the person is performing ghusl and he intends to lift the measure impurity and the minor impurity as well so that he will be able to pray of course, if you do anything which nullifies the wudu, then you must redo the wudu from the beginning. If the ghusl was for refreshment or cleaning up, then it doesn't matter whether you do it during or after. What matters is this ghusl anyway is not sufficient for the prayer. You will have to make an independent wudu after you finish your ghusl. So of course, that wudu will take care of breaking wind. Um, Shaykh, can I say Subhanallah al azim wa bihamdihi three times in sujood? No. Because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Amma al-ruku' fa'azzimu fiha al-rab. So Subhanallah rabbi al azim glory be to my Lord, the great is to be recited in ruku'ah. Subhana Rabbi al azim Subhana Rabbi al azim or Subhana Rabbi al azim wa bihamdi. While in sujood, you say Subhana Rabbi al a'la glory be to my Lord, the Most High, and you do not switch. Okay? Muhammad uh, Shafiq is asking, I want you to require or inquire about sending salah and salam on our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu after listening to lecture on the topic, I replace all my dua and constantly sends peace and blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu except in my fard and sunnah prayer. I do not recite any other dua though we are in the same time of difficulties. Is that fine? Well, based on the hadith that you heard, إِذَنْ تُكْفَى If you... Um, spend the whole time of making dua instead of making dua you send the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet Sallallahu all your needs will be taken care of because Allah already knows what uh, your needs are this is a hadith but the scholars say the best is a combination of both because the Almighty Allah also said in the Quran Ud'uni astajib lakum so this is a divine command to make dua, to invoke Allah, and He promised to answer. So the best case scenario is, in the morning, 10 times, 100 times, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ala ali Muhammad, kama sallayta ala Ibrahim wa ala ali Ibrahim, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin nabi wa ahlihi wa sallim taslima, or any form of sending the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa 10 times, 100 times, in the evening likewise. And every time you want to make dua, send the peace and the blessings upon the Prophet before, then make the dua which suits the urge or the need that you have in mind. Barakallahu feekum brothers and sisters. By that we've come to the end of today's uh, episode of Ask Huda. Until next one, I leave you all in the care of Allah. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته